ಹ್ಞೂ ಸರಿ ನೋಡು ನಿಧಾನ ಪಾಸ್ ಹಾಂ ಹಾಂ ನೀನು ನಿಧಾನ ಮಾಡಿ ಏನು ಯೋಚನೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅವನು ಮಾಡಿದ ಮೇಲೆ ನೀನು ಯೋಚನೆ ಮಾಡಬೇಡ ಎಷ್ಟೋ ಥರ ಆಗಲಿ ಪರವಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಓಕೆ ಓಕೆ ಹ್ಞೂ ಹ್ಞೂ ಶಿಪ್ರ ಮ್ಯಾಮ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಅವರ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಎಸ್ ಎಸ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಸಂತೋಷ್ ಸರ್ ವಿ ಜಾಯಿನ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಸಮ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಟಿಲ್ ದೆನ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಓಕೆ ದೆನ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಸೋ ವೆನ್ ಸಂತೋಷ್ ಸರ್ ವಿಲ್ ಜಾಯಿನ್ ಹಿ ಹಿ ವಿಲ್ ಜಾಯಿನ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯೂ ಮಿನಿಟ್ಸ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಹಿ ಇಸ್ ಬಿಜಿ ವಿತ್ ಸಮ್ ಮೀಟಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ರೈಟ್ ನೌ ಓಕೆ 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 good afternoon to all of you uh, arindan sir am i audible sir uh, yes ma'am you are audible but please wait yeah uh, yeah, our... yeah i'm waiting yeah okay. actually i'm just okay. testing whether my uh, mic okay. is working yes yes thank yes. you you are completely perfectly audible yes thank you sir.
Shipra ma'am, are you here? Hello, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, Shipra ma'am, please uh, ask uh, Santosh sir, uh, when will we start our program? Santosh sir has uh, instructed us to uh, start the program. He will join in the middle of the program. Okay, 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 okay thank you. So, Moon Moon ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, you can start. Okay. So, here, the very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, today, here is Moon Moon, and my name is Moon Moon Sain, faculty from SIAR. And today, I'm the coordinator. And uh, uh, let's start today's session. And first of all, I would like to welcome all of you in our three days online capacity building program. And today is the third day and the final day, of course. And uh, so first of all, I want to request Mr. Arindam Ray, Director Academic Affairs, Saya, to present brief introduction about the second day capacity building program. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Manman ma'am. Uh, welcome all of you on the third day capacity building program on climatic hazard and financial resilience jointly organized by NITM and SIAD. We are fortunate that yesterday Major General VK Naik sir joined with us. He gave special lecture on disaster mitigation, conceptual issues and practices. Sir focused on disaster management continuum man mitigation measures he expressed about the requirements for effective mitigation he explained the how schools teacher the student can also take part in this mitigation program by involving the common people also he divides the mitigation activities into two parts the structural and non-structural part apart after that our next speaker was dr avay shivastrava the research scientist from NISAC, he delivered his lecture on lightning, now casting and risk reduction using the ground space data and technologies. He discussed the observation data, worldwide lightning distribution, and so on. The next speaker was Dr. Kosturi Mukherjee. She delivered her lecture over the journey of map. She emphasized over the impact of urban environment, giving importance over the urban land. She also expressed the thermal image, and through thermal image, she expressed the temperature variation in different urban area. So the yesterday's session was really outstanding and enriched, and we are all hoping that today's session is also will be delighted one. So without wasting any time, we are looking forward to our today's session. Over to you, Mon Mon Ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And now we are at the point where we will we will be able to hear from uh, today's eminent speakers, and they are Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed, Dr. Abhishek Shah, and Colonel Sanjay Srivastava. So, first of all, I would like to welcome our first eminent speaker, Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed. About him, I wanted to add, he is an associate professor and previous program convener of the Master of Disaster Resilience and Sustainable Development, University of Newcastle, Australia. He teaches social and policy aspects of disaster risk reduction, resilience of the built environment and sustainable development. His research interests include post-disaster housing, disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation and urbanization in the Asia Pacific. He has written several books and many peer-reviewed publications and engages in various research and evaluation projects relating to disaster resilience. Dr. Ahmed serves as a consultant and technical advisor of, for a number of international development and humanitarian agencies and produced many evaluation and uh, project reports. He has studied and worked in several countries, including Australia, Bangladesh, Germany, India, Thailand, UK, and USA, and has extensive research and professional experience in many countries particularly in South and Southeast Asia. Dr. Ahmed completed his PhD from Oxford, Oxford Brooks University, UK, Master of Science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA, and Bachelor of Architecture from the Indian Institute of Technology, India. So uh, now over to you, Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed, sir. 
good afternoon for you. Good evening for me. Thank you very much for your kind uh, and very um, uh, detailed introduction, Madam uh, Munmun. So um, I think I will just start since uh, you've given an introduction. So let me, what I just wanted to talk about today is uh, focusing on uh, climate adaptive housing. And I know that the focus of this particular event is on climate financing. And so I won't directly talk so much about financing, but just what I wanted to add before I start off is that this particular presentation that I'm doing is drawn from a project proposal that we submitted to the Green Climate Fund. Now, many of you may know that the Green, Green Climate Fund is one of the major funding for the financing organizations to deal with climate change adaptation throughout the world, particularly in the Global South countries. Um, so, so I just want to say like, you know, this is the kind of thing one would have to do in order to gain financing to implement climate change adaptation projects. So let me see if I can share my screen. I'm not very familiar with uh, Microsoft Teams, so let me try it screen. Are you able to see my PowerPoint? Yes, this is visible, sir. Excellent. Great, so let me just start then. Yes, so like I mentioned, this this is about time change adaptive housing in coastal Bangladesh. And I believe that most of you are from India and you can relate very well to your neighboring country, Bangladesh, and uh, some of the conditions are very similar, particularly the coastal regions and uh, both Bangladesh and, uh, and part of West Bengal uh, suffer similar impacts of climate change. So, so as I mentioned, this is drawn from a feasibility study for uh, which was done for the United Nations Development Program (UNDP), and I certainly won't go through all these points. I just want to quickly, you know, give you an overview of what this is all about. And so what I will do is go to the next one. And this is the coastal housing context. And uh, most of you from India, you are quite familiar with this kind of co this context, this kind of uh, situation. Basically here, Bangladesh has got a very long coastline over 700 kilometers. And, and yes, India has a much longer coastline, but this particular coastline Bangladesh is exposed uh, to cyclones, particularly because it's a very low lying uh, region and also because of the shape of the Bay of Bengal, which kind of draws in air from uh, the wider Indian Ocean and, and this kind of contributes to kind of cycloning impact that you have and you, you're quite familiar with, with these kind of impacts. And, and but importantly with cyclones, there's also a storm surge, sometimes exceeding nine meters. It's very high, it's almost like a tsunami, and that has massive impacts, and they have long-term impacts. In many of the areas that had been affected by storm surges, the water actually inundated vast tracts of land, and the water could not be drained out because the, it kind of breached the coastal embankments. And and they in some places, they stayed for years before the water ran, and that you can imagine the kind of impact that can have on agriculture and, and settlements. So one interesting thing is that in Bangladesh and perhaps also in India to, to a large extent, what has happened is in recent years, the fatalities from cyclones, they have been reduced. So just to give you some examples, Cyclone Pola in 1970, more than uh, half a million people perished. And then the recent cyclone Amphan last year was only 26 in Bangladesh. And I'll, I think, believe all together with India, it's about 80. So it's it's not huge. I mean, of course, it's tragic that these people still, you know, had, you know, faced the faced death at the, end of, uh, at the hands of this event. But but you know, things like like these kind of shelters, and I haven't talked about it, and there's not, not much scope, but these cyclone shelters scattered around the coastal area, they save people's lives together with, uh, with an approach of an early warning system, uh, which comprises of the cyclone preparedness program, which is at the grassroots level, connected with the Central Meteorological Bureau. So that is how it functions. Um, just to show you a photograph, this was from Cyclone Isla in 2009. 
and you can see the inundation and there you can see the coastal embankment on the top right and once that got breached the water got trapped inside and it was very hard to drain it out it needs a lot of resources to pump the water out and 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 so people lost their uh, pisciculture as well as agriculture and and settlements sorry yep so the coastal housing context, so, and, and simply I'm, I'm continuing on, on that and I have to be careful of the time. So I'll go a bit fast on this and range of climate change impacts. And that is why I think, and, and it, the link of cyclones to climate change has now been well established, but also sea level rise, salinity intrusion, and all this affects the housing and settlement patterns in, in uh, coastal areas. And even though there's been recent economic development in Bangladesh, this has not led down to much change for the majority of the rural population in the country and particularly in coastal areas. And, and, and you can see the kind of, this is reflected in the kind of housing, 75, 79%, almost 80% of uh, the rural housing in Bangladesh, they tend to be of kacha type materials. I, I'm sure you know the term. Or, or marginal, chupri kind of, you know, dwellings. So, yeah, and 90% of the housing, they use non-resilient materials. Even if they use corrugated iron sheets, it's just non-resilient, can fly off. So just to give you an idea, this is kind of the risk map, cyclone risk map of Bangladesh, and you can see that the red part is the area most at risk, but then the adjacent areas and uh, point the way inland, almost up to the capital Dhaka, they can be wind impact. And this diagram that you see about around here, it's not very clear, but you can see where the concentration of high poverty is. And the black parts, the darker the color is, the more poverty there is. And you can see the dark parts are actually concentrated right along the coast, and particularly in the main delta of the Podda River, which is the Gonga in India, which comes into Bangladesh. And so in that particular project, we focus on these districts, the ones in pink color, uh, to focus on these uh, districts to, you know, to do the intervention where the highest, the highest risk as well as the high poverty is concentrated. So, and this is quite common and you from India, you are very uh, well aware, I'm sure of this kind of uh, types of construction. One is the kacha type, you know what they are made out of organic materials and sometimes, you know, industrial products, plastic sheets, cheap corrugated iron sheets, all that kind of stuff. And then there's the semi kacha. It is also not very high uh, durable, there's low durability and then and then finally, there's a semi pakka when they may have brick walls and flooring, but then they have corrugated iron roofing sheets, like you can see in the photograph below. And then finally, the pakka, which is brick walls and reinforced concrete. And in our part of the world, you're familiar with that kind of construction. And, and that kind of construction is not usually common in rural areas. It's not really affordable for most people. At the most, they can go up to the semi pakka level. There's increasing growth of semi pakka housing in rural areas now, but, but the concrete roofing can be very expensive. So, so the Climate Adaptive Housing CAH or DRH, Disaster Resilient Housing Initiatives, I just want to give you some examples so that you know how it's uh, approached. So there were two major cyclones in recent years, Amphan also, but I have not uh, gone to those cyclones. Mora also, we didn't have such massive impact, but these two, Sidir in 2007 and Isla in 2009, they had severely impacted coastal areas. And just to give you some figures, in, in after Sidir, the housing sector losses, it was uh, more than 800 million, which is a lot of money, and more than 200 million was required for reconstruction in the 12 more district, 12 most affected districts. And then after two years, only half of that money was raised and only 5% was built. So you can see the problem. And then, um, there's the self-recovery and self-recovery is now espoused by many international organizations that by the time they organize their paperwork, their procurement and their logistics to get the ground and start a project, people have started recovering. The train has already left the station by then in many cases. And so it's, it's uh, many of them have to put something together, some makeshift kind of arrangement and they have to live in areas, but 
uh, nevertheless, you know, that is the way forward. And nowadays, agencies are trying to supplement that mm -hmm. self-recovery approach, but that's a different discussion we will have on a different occasion about self-recovery processes. But just to give an idea, the 80% of the people actually recover by themselves. The other issue is important to remember in the context of this particular event is the future damages that are supposed to like happen. It's going to increase five times by 2050 with climate change, the kind of uh, cyclones that we have now already ferocious, but they'll become increasingly violent and uh, increasingly, you know, like uh, impactful. So I think that is something to watch out. And this is what I will talk about when I talk about what we need to do in the future for climate proofing and climate adapting. So just to give you some very quick examples of the kind of housing that is done there. In this particular case, this was a project by UNDP and because this for uh, pro this proposal was uh, commissioned by uh, UNDP, we wanted to look at what they had done. And this is after, uh, you know, a cyclone and we went to this area, very remote coastal areas. And we found that uh, there's these houses you can see on the right and this on the left, you can see the kind of houses people build by themselves this kind of recovery. You can see the corrugated iron sheets have become very common, but there's still a lot of organic culture type materials. But you can see what they have done. They actually did some good things. They built this access road made out of uh, brick soling. At least it gives a little bit of, you know, safety, but uh, these are the houses made out of brick and corrugated metal sheets, very good quality metal sheets for sure. But then there were some all kinds of design problems. The roof eave was too uh, short and the water could enter between the gaps and they, were, they had the PVC gutters for collecting rainwater because in this particular part of the country, they have a very severe problem of salinity intrusion. So the water that they have, the subsoil water, is not really very drinkable. So the idea that rainwater was kind of um, uh, promoted in this, but it, they were not really, really working. People were not using it. The, because of soil water, it was not great, but they still managed to do it somehow. People are resilient. They kind of adapt to things which can be quite difficult for many people. And then they had the seal roof uh, framing, which was durable, but you know, this kind of framing, they cannot build it anyway. No one else could do it this, because this was a UNDP funded project. They could manage to get some of these materials. So we have to be very careful what we do, but unless there's a long term project that kind of supports housing on a wider scale, these would remain isolated examples. So I can go on. I, I won't talk again. There was the other issue is that people were still using asbestos. And as you know, that asbestos poses health issues. So, show you another one. And this particular project isn't terribly bad. It's, it's, it's in some ways it offers some good insights. What had happened was that again, this was the settlement outside the coastal embankment. I remember I mentioned the coastal embankment at a certain point, but people, because of the population pressure on land, people actually settle outside the embankment and they are absolutely vulnerable to a, a disaster and even the regular impacts of sea level rise and all that. So a tidal surges, so that, that's what it is. But in this particular project, they, uh, they resettled those people who were outside the embankment and moved inland. And then, but you can see in this photograph that people, even though they were, they relocated the original settlement. Many people actually started building another new settlement outside the embankment. So this continues. In any case, in this particular case, this had an integrated approach. It had fish ponds, and you can see some of the fish ponds here together with a group of houses clustered around it. They had solar energy and the livelihood programs, and they also had a cyclone shelter, which worked as a school most of the time. And so they had some positive impacts because they did built the resilience of those people. And these houses were pakka type houses. There was a prefab uh, concrete components. They were brought in from the capital, Dhaka. And so some of the issues again, short roofy, the water enters the gap, same as the previous project. And so again, uh, with these kind of, you know, similar to the other projects, it's not replicable in the local context because of the technology or the skills to do it. And so there's an extra cost of transporting them to the an embodied energy cost, and there's also you know, breakage and that kind of uh, problem happening. 
And main issue is that the community consultation of the participation was missing in this particular project. This was uh, conceived by the implementation implementing organization, which was actually the government project, uh, house, house Building Research Institute, together with the Comprehensive Disaster Management Program of the government. And very small houses, but they could be core shelters because they were actually quite strongly built. And they said these were sort of uh, mini shelters and people started making these extensions. You can see this house, how it's been surrounded by all kinds of extensions. So be it, because if there's a cyclone, they can at least go into that core shelter, which is built to cyclone like, resistant sandals and it can save lives. Similar kind of project, I won't go through each and every project. Again, the, these were also pucker type houses. Increasingly, agencies are moving towards pucker type housing because they want to maintain their legacy. If they build something and if it doesn't last in the next disaster, then uh, they would be held accountable. So this is one reason that they do it. And but again, no community consultation, and so there was no community. So there are all kinds of issues, technical issues. Also, there was only a tie beam, no grade beam. So the, there's a great beam above, uh, tie beam above, but below the ground there was no great beam. So if there would be, uh, you know, another cyclone, then it might collapse on the base because of scouring and lateral stress. And also, same thing. It's they're all very small houses, but they can be a cold shelter. So, but again, the problem with asbestos, even in the previous one, this is widely prevalent even now in rural areas. There's still entrepreneurs who kind of market asbestos even though there's legislation against this use, but this can barely be enforced. This is another project, it's also a government project by the Prime Minister's office, and this is quite interesting because they actually built these Pakha um, uh, uh, houses, and they were all like joined together. They had a sense of community and, and they had, uh, and they built, there were no kitchens inside, which is fine. They can build outdoor kitchens, but again, this would protect lives in case there is a disaster. So they had some good sides, but there were problems. It was no beneficiary consultant consultation built by the army. And uh, also they had problems, problems for privacy in rural areas. Houses are detached small units and they maintain a level of privacy with vegetation in between and all that. But they, that's it's just next to each other. So uh, you can hear the person next door. So I think it's a kind of shift to a somewhat urban mode of living. We can discuss, you know, the pros and cons of that kind of transformation. And uh, the other problem with using concrete and not that it is a bad material because some kind of uh, like uh, um, uh, safety in a future cyclonic event. But the problem is if you don't build properly with it, it needs a lot of supervision and quality control. Otherwise, you may have dampness and water leakage, particularly in a hot, humid climate like this. So that has to be ensured. And this is another project. This is uh, the last one I will show you. I won't bore you too much because uh, I've already showed you quite a few projects. So this one is quite interesting, and this was done by uh, a very large NGO called BRAC, Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, together again with the UNDP. And in this particular project, it was also a resettlement project. And this particular area was underwater for more than two years, and people were living on the you know embankment, and and and, and they were like you know living in makeshift shelters but so they built again it almost like a mini shelter it was raised on uh, stills but what had happened is that after some time they wanted to use local materials they didn't want to use corrugated iron sheet the roofing tiles and this is quite common in india but in, in bangladesh this is not very common they tend to use uh, ci sheet cgi sh uh, roofing sheets is, is, is more common but they tried to use that but Again, people weren't familiar with the material and the workmanship wasn't very good. Water started coming in and the timber walls, they wanted to use natural materials, but that didn't weather too well in this coastal uh, saline environment. <laughs> so over time, people, uh, they, they requested UNDP to replace those. And so what they did was replace them with brick walls and corrugated iron sheets. And then people were quite happy and they started making extensions and improvements, extensive plantations. And sort of this project eventually helped the community to get stabilized, and it was a stepping stone towards long-term resilience in, in some way. So it has, it, it started off with some hiccups, but eventually the agency was kind of uh, open to consultations and, and feedback from the community. 
So this was just to give you an overview of the kind of project. So eventually, <laughs> in this particular project, we had to propose a framework for climate adaptive housing for coastal areas. And in this case, we started looking at the settlement patterns. And then you can see this is how they do it. They would uh, dig a pond and use the soil to raise land above the water level. And you can see and get like extensive in the side to hold the soil and and use use the trees and vegetation for livelihoods and you know forms of consumption. So this is a typical pattern, and you, you might be able to see that in parts of West Bengal in the Delta region. So in this particular case, there was a, we kind of looked at design criteria, the house size layout, etc., the kind of issues that all uh, designers would consider when they build a house, and then follow some minimum standards. So there was a shelter working group. They had uh, developed certain standards for core shelters, and those uh, those were supposed to be followed in in the design guideline and in the construction technology. Here, we decided to use brick and uh, reinforced concrete construction because. <coughs> that in the future we can anticipate the cycles to become more ferocious and we would need to have some kind of structure that can withstand the kind of ferocity. People are not going to move away from the coastal area they need to inhabit and perhaps, you know, increase in population. So we would have to think about something which can give them some sort of security. And even if there's one house in the locality like that, other neighbors can go and take shelter there and they can serve as many shelters. So that was the idea. And so we also thought about the different housing topologies and I'll show you a diagram how we thought about that. There could be a typical unit and there could be different kind of arrangements and according to the preference of the homeowners and, uh, and and the site site conditions, the context particularly. And remember this was, I can't remember, you remember the exact figure, but there was a very large number of houses that were proposed to be built in, in around the coastal belt in those uh, nine districts that I showed you. And then it also had to follow a settlement pattern. It's not only building houses, but uh, preparing land for flood and storm protection and the courtyard layouts and ponds and all that. And then finally, the infrastructure services houses are not just houses. They, they just need water supply, sanitation and electricity, transport links and all that. So this was the basic framework within that. This was the kind of housing topology that we proposed. As you can see that this is the basic unit. It's a two room house, a very simple, very similar to with the veranda in front, which is also very common. And then they can start combining it in different ways. They could have a, have a single story flat on the ground. They could raise it above if there's coastal flooding. They could have a two story house. So there could be two families, extended family together. And, and they could build the kitchens and uh, toilets outside as typical. If they go in the storm, it's fine. They can build it very quickly with uh, local available materials. They could also combine it into a cluster dwelling in the settlement once it starts getting more and more urbanized. So that was the basic idea. It's just one unit which can be played around in different configurations. So finally, coming to the conclusion, I think I've taken too much time, so I won't go into in great detail. Basically, just to quickly tell you that we know the context is it's got vulnerable housing and disaster resilient housing and climate adaptive housing. It's it's unaffordable. They have very limited choices, and we have to think more towards pucker construction in this context, but it's a very high cost. And unless there's support and finance, climate finance, and this is where it comes from, from organizations like the Green Climate Fund, where we can make the case, a persuasive case, that they would have to fund uh, housing, which is more expensive at, and uh, replicated at a wider scale, so that the future vulnerability of fast population groups will need to be reduced. And, and also, they don't want, you know, the houses to be built, like destroy the next disaster, there's a liability issue. And, uh, and, and I've given you the design idea, and uh, um, so yes, that was the number for twenty thousand uh, houses, disasters in houses or climate adaptive housing in the eight coastal districts. As I mentioned later on, it was nine. That's why I mentioned they added another district, and it was a five-year program. And so that's about it for me. I think I will stop here. Uh, this acknowledgement to the United States Development Program. That is the name of the feasibility study that I was talking about. And thank you very much. Dhanubad, shukriya. Thank you, sir. And uh...
thank you very much sir and this is really a nice gather of information on climate adaptive housing and now here is a question answer session uh, going to begin and uh, participant have any query please ask the question having any query please ask the question or you can text also any comments also welcome Participants have any query, please ask here. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Iftikar, sir, uh, you, uh, you can stop presenting, sir. Like, by just clicking on the tray, sir. Clicking on the, sorry. Means there may be the option of stop presenting. So by doing that, it will be like little bit. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah, I think that's better. Thank you, sir. Yes, the participant over to you. If uh, any query, please text us or you can ask the question also. They're thinking. Uh, it requires time some time because to go through the presentations and then having the queries. Yeah, it sometimes takes time sir, to have a query. I think they can uh, ask the questions uh, later after the all the sessions together. Yeah, that's also good. Okay. I, I am afraid I may not be able to stay that long. It's already OK, sir. OK. Tonight here in the evening. I, I can come back if you give me a time or uh, Q&A at the end. You're yeah. all welcome, sir. Whenever you want to join after your free uh, uh, other work. Uh, so you will be finishing at 4.30? Yes, sir. OK, so maybe I'll join you at maybe 4.15, something like that. Right, sir, right. Yeah, I can do that. In the meantime, I'll, I'll catch up on certain things and then uh, I'll listen to the next speaker anyway. So and then, and then I'll just slowly bail out at a. <laughs> yeah. And look, you know, participants, please don't be shy. If you have questions, you can contact me. I, I'm happy to share my uh, contact details. You can find me very easily. Look for Ifti Ahmed, University of Newcastle. You'll find me on the internet and we can communicate. You know, the side if you feel reluctant to pose a question. <laughs> But I hope this presentation uh, kind of resonated with your experiences in, in yes, your. Sir. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Now our next speaker is Dr. Abhishek Shah. He will give special lecture on climatic and ecotoxicological threats on estuaries and their probable mitigation plan. Uh, Dr. Abhishek Shah is currently working as an assistant professor and head of the department, uh, Department of Geography, Chhatra Ramai Pandit, Mahavidyalay, Pakura University since July 28, 2020 to till date. He is also chaired as course coordinator of distance learning program organized by Indian Institute of Remote Sensing in ISRO Nodal Center. Dr. Shah, has six years expertise uh, pertaining to the field of oceanol oceanography, wetland ecology, estuarine ecosystem, environmental uh, toxicology, and application of geospatial technology and statistical techniques. He has done his PhD in oceanography. He has published more than 20 publications in various peer-reviewed UGC approved and UGC care journals and four book chapters with ISBN indexed. He has also authored two books on environmental studies for undergraduate level. He has attended several national and international seminars on different environmental and oceanographic uh, issues. He also acted as nodal officer of different program initiated by higher education department uh, government of West Bengal. From 2021 to till date and appointed as board observer of West Bengal Joint Interest Examination Board in 
2021. He has appointed as undergra uh, undergraduate examiner both honors a program of Bakura University from 2020 till date. He has been awarded as UGC Junior Research Fellow in Geography on 2014 and awarded Research Scientist in 2019 International Scientist Award. Vishaka Pattanam by Professional Association, VD Good Professional Association. So here we have uh, Dr. Shah along with us. Over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to all. And uh, first of all, uh, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, sir, Honorable Executive uh, Director, NITM, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, and uh, Supervising Patron of this uh, three days online training program. Dr. Bishwajit Rai Jodhari, Honorable Chairman, South Asian Institute of Advanced Research and Development and uh, Supervising uh, Patron of this three days online uh, training course. Professor Santosh Kumar, Professor and Head Governance, Inclusive Disaster Risk Reduction in NIDM, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India and convener of this uh, three days uh, online training course. Dr. A.S. Dayal, Faculty and Director, Center for Disaster Management and Planning, SIARD and also convener of this uh, three days online training course. Program coordinators, uh, Mr. Arindam Roy, D Director, Academic Affairs, uh, SIARD, Ms. Antara Kundu, Project Executive, SIARD, Ms. Uh, Sipra Das, Project Executive, uh, NIDM, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Munmun Bormon, Faculty, Geoinformatics Division, SIARD, uh, esteemed participants and uh, of, uh, of this online training program. Uh, uh, present in this virtual platform from these different parts of the country, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. Uh, it is my proud uh, privilege to be present here uh, in this virtual platform before a galaxy of uh, dignitary par participants, personalities, eminent uh, teachers, uh, different parts of the country for three days online training program titled Climatic Hazards and Financial Resilience, a special focus on lightning jointly organized by uh, National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, and Center for Disaster Management of and Planning, SIARD. Today, I, am, uh, I will give my talk, uh, intend to give my talk, uh, climatic and ecotoxicological threats on estuaries and their uh, probable mitigation plan, special reference to the Northeast coast of India. So uh, now I uh, intend to share my PPT. Is it visible? Is it visible? Uh, no, sir. Okay, not now. Visible? Uh, yes, sir. Now you can open the. Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, okay. So, thank you to give me the opportunity to present my uh, talk. So, this is the key uh, notes that is the environment, coastal environment is uh, presently experiencing several types uh, uh, in the current scenario that is uh, salinity alteration, pollution, uh, siltation, illegal catching and netting, you know, some uh, sea level rise issues. Uh, due to climatic change, uh, increasing uh, uh, the intensity and the frequency of uh, tropical cyclones, emerging seafloor uh, uh, due to uh, estuary uh, rejuvenation, and different uh, non-scientific uh, non scientific activities. These are the, uh, some keynotes. So this is the objectives, evolution of the present data, uh, analysis the threats, scaling the threats uh, with uh, the score of the basis of the magnitude, and development some conservation measures that uh, the, uh, uh, to uh, uh, the quality um, to improve the quality of the coastal water or backwater or the estuarian water. And uh, uh, here I am uh, select the uh, living organisms uh, like a fish as a pollution indicator uh, to uh, analyze the uh, present uh, uh, work. So these are the phys uh, physiographic uh, consider there is a three uh, river uh, sea mouth or uh, river mouth uh, that is first Ganga, uh, Subarnarekha, and uh, Mohanodi uh, estuary. These uh, three estuaries are different in uh, physio, uh, in 
physiological uh, perspective and uh, uh, some uh, physiographic perspective, geomorphological perspective and climatological perspective. So uh, there is a huge uh, catchment area uh, of Ganga, as you know, that uh, there is this huge uh, catchment area and there is a huge tributary and branches of this river. And uh, next is uh, Orissa. In Orissa, there is, uh, uh, there is a huge region that is uh, on uh, Plateau region. We know that there is these uh, two, uh, these uh, Subarna Rekha Basin. This is also a, a huge basin uh, uh, in uh, context uh, to uh, uh, capturing some runoffs uh, from uh, different parts of the uh, uh, basin area. So uh, these are the uh, another uh, uh, basin uh, uh, tributaries of Brahmani and Boitarani uh, uh, river. And these are the materials, uh, some major threads uh, that is we classified into two major uh, threads that is uh, geophysical and anthropological. So these are the illegal seed collection. We know that uh, there is also, uh, th these are the happening in, in here. Uh, prawn seed collection, uh, a huge amount of uh, prawn seeds, uh, seedlings are collected um, uh, before their uh, um, uh, breeding uh, uh, period. Uh, and uh, these are some uh, uh, climatic uh, uh, and uh, um, tectonic events uh, happening uh, in these uh, Indian Oceans uh, or Indian Ocean plates. Uh, as you know, that there, there is a, uh, in current uh, few decades, there is an intensity of different tropical cyclones like Ida, Cedar, Filene. All the all of this happening here, and also 2004, uh, four, there is a massive tsunami hits uh, uh, in this part of the um, estuary. These are the one of the most alarming uh, uh, threats that is uh, global warming and plate tectonic, and uh, there is a upliftment and a, a submergence of uh, sea floor, and due to the huge of uh, huge. Uh, Coastal part or sea mount or the um, uh, shallow what uh, shallow land mass uh, uh, uplift uplift and uh, due to this upliftment uh, during uh, cyclonic storm huge oceanic surges are uh, happening there and uh, therefore uh, huge saline water intruded in the inner part of the fresh water body and uh, um, affect uh, very much. These are the major uh, threats that is uh, mangrove deforestation, a huge amount of uh, 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 amount and huge uh, intensity of uh, cutting of the mangrove uh, tree. As you know, that the mangrove is a huge, uh, uh, in creating a huge impact on the uh, uh, on the uh, protecting uh, field of uh, uh, land erosion, soil, uh, uh, or uh, uh, some salinity increase or some. Uh, sedimentation and uh, these are this. Uh, so these are the next, uh, as I, I already told that this is sedimentation and siltation is a uh, part uh, taking place, huge amount of uh, siltation are uh, uh, um, happening there. And these are the, some uh, graphical and satellite imageries. Uh, this is unscientific weakness. As you know, in far distance, that there is a huge uh, 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 different uh, uh, brick cleans are there. And, and these brick cleans are uh, much more affected. And uh, as you know, in front of uh, our screen, they, these are the mangroves. And um, these mangroves are very sensitive to the environment and, uh, 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 and much more influenced by this. There is a huge um, brick wall that is uh, breaking uh, through, uh, breakthrough and some saline water intruded in the inner part of the uh, land. So uh, some statistical figures are there. Uh, these are the, some, uh, uh, some fish species. I already told that the fish species are uh, here is uh, pollution indicators and uh, some major species are there. And uh, there is a fish landing station, FLC, a different uh, 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 Balashur district. Uh, and this is the uh, Sanon winner uh, species diversity index, uh, which is a very uh, widely known uh, species diversity index, which is much more affected by this uh, uh, yeah, uh, this uh, threats. And this is the um, results of the statistical analysis. And that, that is the 2016-2017 data that is we have collected in uh, the survey. Um, and uh, these are the, some threat uh, techniques. And here we know that there is a uh, bronze seed collections, uh, irregular fishing, uh, siltation, sedimentation, and natural calamities are creating a havoc uh, in, uh, 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 impact on the uh, uh, physiographic uh, divisions.
to let uh, uh, came to the discussion. Uh, this is a grand challenges of our uh, climate uh, science uh, and uh, civil engineering in the coming decades. That is prediction of the sea level uh, and the development of adaptation approaches. So climatic change and coastal resources are the main uh, um, uh, aspects uh, that is uh, that in uh, current uh, current year, the whole central or state government majorly focus on the blue economy and the blue economy is the current uh, 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 current aspects uh, of the new researchers and uh, uh, and creating a huge huge resource uh, for our country. And uh, that is, uh, these are the uh, research uh, uh, that is uh, threatening by uh, uh, climate change. That is higher sea level, higher sea temperature, El Nino, that is uh, um, Enso, uh, in, uh, Enso and La Nina, uh, changes of precipitation patterns, um, changing of storm uh, tracks, uh, etc. So these are the uh, coastal climatic change drivers. That is mean sea level, sea level uh, primary uh, level, uh, current, ocean current, wind uh, climate, rainfall, and the secondary is local sea level, local current, local uh, wave, and groundwater. Some uh, climatic changing factors. That is uh, some extreme event hazards or some non-regional uh, mean sea level hazards. So these are the uh, time frame, and uh, in time frame, this is uh, this is the uh, uh, event, and the, there is a cause, and there is a predictability uh, in this uh, sense. As, as you all know, there is a huge uh, uh, impact on Enso, and uh, uh, creating a, a disturbance throughout the whole uh, world climatic systems. Potential impact of the climatic change, as you know, that is um, coastal erosions, uh, beach uh, rotations, uh, infrastructure damage, uh, algae or algal bloom, harmful algal bloom, uh, wetland productions, uh, sediment nutrients. So, climatic change in global context uh, that is uh, uh, estimated uh, due to 1860 to 2000 uh, and uh, 2000 to 2100. Uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, there is a uh, international uh, policy for climatic change uh, report uh, we have uh, gathered that is uh, in uh, us in 2050. That is a um, huge uh, uh, climatic change or sea level rise due to uh, uh, oceanic temp uh, uh, temperature or a temperature global temperature rise. So non climatic drivers are the port uh, harbor construction, coastal protection works. Uh, upstream uh, damming, hydraulic, hydroelectric uh, power, deforestation, etc. So current uh, predictions of uh, sea level uh, is uh, uh, in which method that is conclusion about the future uh, sea level rise uh, in the IPCC and uh, the third assessment report 2001 and fourth assessment report 2007 we have uh, already uh, stored and the IPCC AR4 projections also gather in uh, and that is sea level up to 79 centimeter by 2000 uh, to 100 uh, years uh, in the state banks. So uh, cyclonic disorders, uh, disasters, uh, uh, we have uh, classified into basically three uh, segments. That is gusting speed, wind, or storm during landfall, high tidal surges uh, between, uh, before and after landfall, and heavy intensified and fall after cyclone. These are the uh, three uh, aspects uh, that is huge, uh, creating huge uh, damage uh, uh, during cyclonic landfall. So major and medium multi-purpose river dam projects, which uh, already uh, we uh, taken it up to consideration. That is catchment area, uh, Mohanadi. Uh, there is huge. Uh, uh, there is a new numbers of dams out there. There is Hirakun, Ravi Shankar, uh, Dudawa, uh, Sandur, uh, Hasidio, uh, Tendula. These are some um, major dams uh, on Mohanadi and some tributaries. And uh, as you know, that Mohanadi is a non-perennial uh, non river. And uh, due to this, uh, the, there is a lack of a huge uh, freshwater uh, mixing, lack of freshwater mixing in the seamounts. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, there is an increase of salinity in, the, in that area. So that is uh, another Subono Rekha Basin. These are the uh, major uh, dams of projects uh, uh, are there. There is a 12 projects uh, 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 on the uh, uh, Subono Rekha. And it is also a non perennial river. And uh, this is a uh, much more effect on the uh, coastal uh, water mixing um, or uh, river mouth mixing. And uh, uh, also, we know that um, the Mohanadri estuary, uh, Mohanadri Basin is uh, uh, um, uh, famously known as. Uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, industrial area or and uh, uh, as well as uh, 
mining area and the huge uh, industrial wastage of sewages and uh, mining sewages are mixing into water and some heavy metals are mixing also are there. So uh, these are the facts, factors uh, uh, and these are the potential impact. Some bio, uh, uh, physical impact, like displacement of coastal lowlands, increased coastal er erosions, increased flooding, salin uh, salinization, groundwater, socioeconomic uh, categories uh, under loss of property, increased flood risk, damage of coastal infrastructure, loss of renewable uh, substance resources, loss of tourism, coastal uh, habitats, uh, so on. So, uh, second impact, uh, accelerated uh, sea level rise, that is impact of uh, livelihood, declined health, uh, threat to housing uh, quality, uh, and that already told our uh, previous speaker. Um, infrastructure and economic activity, diversion of resources to adaptation response, increase of protection, increase of the, uh, insurance premium, political and institutional instability, threats to particular cultural or way lives. So, biophysical impacts, these are the huge impact. So these uh, the threats, uh, these great threats uh, to estuaries is far by large scale conversion by draining uh, and filling, damming uh, and reducing these activities result in the immediate destruction of loss of uh, estuary habitats. Pollutions is probably the most important threat to water quality in the estuaries. Poor water quality affects uh, most uh, estuaries organisms, uh, in a, uh, commercially important fish and selfish. The pollutants uh, that have greatest impact on the health uh, estuaries uh, and uh, uh, on all these. Marine uh, culture, reduction of tourism, freshwater um, resources are also there. Human supplements, uh, human health also affected uh, by which that is by which that the eutrophication may also trigger toxic uh, algal blooms like uh, red tides, uh, brown tides, and the growth of uh, 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 Pilfesiaea. It is a single-celled organism that can release very powerful toxins into the water, causing bleeding uh, source of fish and even killing of them. Also, these are the some uh, effects, and also uh, these are the uh, toxic substances. Uh, some of uh, chemical or metals that can use serious illness uh, or death. These may poison us and carcinogenic uh, in nature. So uh, these are the things. And uh, uh, some habitat alterations also uh, are there. Uh, one time destruction also uh, are uh, happening here. Exotic species um, uh, are also dis uh, destroyed. Over exploitation are also happening here. Uh, uh, climatic change, uh, as I already told that. So that is a salt affected um, and water locked area map, uh, uh, Orisha and uh, uh, Western land uh, map, that is Orisha, uh, uh, that is uh, also uh, uh, collected from GIS uh, software by Google uh, Space uh, Program. This is the erosion map of Orisha, Orisha and land use map of Orisha, that is erosional nature of uh, West, uh, West Bengal. Also, these are some interactive sessions with coastal popular people in Gopalpur, uh, Orissa during, uh, and these are the putting some questionnaires to get the uh, feedback uh, to uh, the fishermen and local life, local dwellers uh, to give the better result. As uh, we know that he, they are, all, uh, they are always uh, dwelling with the local environment and local uh, the community. So these are the uh, uh, scaling the threats uh, uh, in, the poly, uh, in using these questionnaires, policymakers, researchers, fishermen, agriculturalists, uh, local inhabitants, and the parameters are also taken. That is erosion, natural disaster, over exploitation, population siltation, and sea level rise. So these are the some ANOVAs are also doing here, and uh, some F, critical, F value and F critical value are considered in here. And uh, uh, due to and uh, from this uh, erosion ANOVA uh, uh, that uh, that is the stakeholder of the both states agreed that the erosion of the river banks or embankments uh, also actually uh, pose a significant adverse impact on fisheries. ANOVA on national disaster is also in, uh, stakeholders uh, consider the natural disaster is highly vulnerable in uh, context to the uh, uh, in context to the uh, resource uh, destructions. Uh, over exploitation of natural resources are also are uh, 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 computed here and this, uh, there is a no difference in opinion amongst the stakeholders, both states in terms of adverse impact of natural resources. Pollution ANOVA also calculated here, that is if, uh, or a critical value, uh, that is the issues of pollution has not been confronted by the stakeholders of both states and un uniformity of the opinions. So use of uh, anti-fouling paints uh, are also uh, affecting the biological and uh, ecosystems. Uh, 
or uh, that these are the anti fouling paints um, uh, uh, in the boards uh, which is um, consist of uh, different uh, heavy metals and these are accumulated into the uh, sea mount um, and was on siltation, this is a, uh, there is a no variation in terms of siltation between the states and uh, as opened by the stakeholders in different categories. So, sea level rise and over also contributed here. Uh, there is a critical valve or a valve also. Uh, there is a huge uh, calculation done here. So, this is a huge uh, uh, um, uh, subject. Potential source of marine, uh, uh, as you know, that is uh, um, uh, domestic sea waste, sea waste, uh, salt, industrial waste, uh, solid waste. Uh, there is also oil spills uh, um, uh, also here. So these are the some uh, historian pollutions. Impact of salinity increase also here, and uh, salinity uh, due to uh, uh, there is a one uh, major uh, incident are happening here. That is, uh, in uh, four uh, forty gram per thousand uh, in um, thousand uh, some prawn seeds are well uh, well uh, um, breeded, but uh, due to lack of food. They uh, they uh, swim and uh, uh, come to the uh, Bhagirathi estuary, uh, and as they uh, born in in the estuary of Mohanadi and three kilometers away, they swim and uh, to get food or uh, uh, food organisms to uh, to, uh, to gather in uh, Bhagirathi estuary, and these are the prawns. And there are some prawns that uh, are destruction as happening here. So these are the field investigation at uh, Sundarbon, uh, as we already done. Uh, some photographs are there. They are measuring some soil pH and soil salinity are also there. Uh, conservation measure. These are the major uh, 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 things. Uh, are uh, there is brood stock management and artificial breeding also we taken uh, for uh, um, uh, some fish uh, to production of fish. Uh, to overcome the problem, larva rearing tank and cluster uh, may be uh, created uh, in generated income uh, through uh, demonstrating or training uh, should be initiated to provide technical support uh, to the private uh, hatchery owners to be also be um, implemented for conservation purpose. Artificial production uh, techniques are also applied to establish an uh, endangered species breeding program. The main uh, two uh, components of the program is la a larval gene bank and the uh, gamete or embryo bank. So mangrove plantation also much more needed uh, planfully in this zone uh, that is low tidal and high tide zone. Strictly prohibition of uh, plastic and microplastics and that and oil spills. These are so uh, hazardous uh, to the uh, uh, living uh, organisms of uh, this area. Pollution mapping also be done on the specified area in a scientific way. That is GIS remote sensing using catchment area analysis should be also done uh, and uh, the sewage analysis also be done. Civil construction should be restricted for that uh, area. Periodical monitoring or dressing process must be supervised thoroughly and uh, suitable uh, measures uh, may be taken. Uh, sea floor uh, that is uh, coral uh, plankton must must be maintained as we know that uh, due to uh, a huge uh, uh, sea level rise and global warming and uh, the mixing of heavy metals in that region uh, huge uh, coral uh, 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 die and destructed and th these corals are too much uh, important um, uh, for uh, uh, protecting the uh, sea surges and uh, these sea surges are so vulnerable uh, because these sea surges uh, uh, are creating the saline water intruded in the um, uh, in the inner part of the fresh water body and the uh, body and the water body fresh water body became saline and the saline water bodies became uh, became so much uh, vulnerable to the uh, to this uh, specific body uh, living or for the uh, organ uh, for the uh, living organism so local level awareness program should be also be initiated to empower the ability to uh, and the habitat uh, with modern alarming system as well as mangrove forestation and other level of uh, society, uh, social forestry these are signature landscape as you know that the uh, 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 mangrove uh, and these are the uh, river chan uh, as channels some some the um, channels uh, and the uh, mangroves are Will protecting uh, the uh, land land part uh, uh, for uh, in place of uh, erosions and the, uh, the in the right uh, uh, path uh, there is a uh, mangrove uh, plantation program initiated. Uh, so these are the references uh, that I followed uh, during my uh, uh, this work. Uh, these are the, some pictures due uh, uh, at the time of our work. 
in Gopalpur, that is some uh, alarming systems are there, that is cyclonic uh, alarming systems in Ganjam districts, uh, some grab collections are also there, and this is uh, sequel estuaries, um, some fish landing stations are, uh, are there, these are the fish uh, that are um, uh, destructed uh, in these uh, regions uh, due to these uh, pollutions. Uh, so thank you all of, uh, thank you to all. Uh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for such an impactful and uh, knowledge-based presentation, and uh, we feel enriched after this presentation. So. Uh, the question and answer session we will take at the end as we uh, as our ma'am said that okay so the our next let's move to the uh, move on to the next presentation and that will be from uh, colonel sanjay shrivastava and uh, let me tell you first that he is a professional with 32 years of experience involved in extreme climate change and disaster risk management as a practitioner in advisory research and teaching role. He is also a convener of Lightning Resilient India campaign and working with India Meteorological Department, Ministry of Earth, Science and ISRO, uh, NRSC, various state uh, governments and uh, uh, agencies in the technical intervention or to adapt climate change issues in governance, especially in agriculture, education and health sector, and focus on comprehensive disaster environment and climate risk management driving for the last one decade. Prior to this, he has uh, had a good exposure of corporate world in media and corporate sector. He is an ex-colonel from Indian Army and has served in various strategic positions in government corporate at various levels with proven leadership skills. He is involved with the states in developmental uh, initiatives with emphasis on climate change adaptation to include policy advocacy, prevention, mitigation, response, rehabilitation, and recovery network, project management, planning and implementation of work plan, budget financial management, coordination with various stakeholders, process evaluation, monitoring, delivery, mo mobilizations of goods and services, capturing lessons and time-bound accomplishments of desired goal by setting up priorities. Uh, priorities. So this will be a privilege to hear from you, sir. So here uh, for you, uh, sir, Sanjay, sir. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I have a presentation. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think your screen is presented now. Uh, you can now open your uh, presentation. Just your screen is visible. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, we can see. Yes. At the very outset, let me thank NIDM and in particular Professor Santosh Kumar and Ms. Shipra for giving me this opportunity to present. The topic of these three days online training program on climatic hazard and financial resilience, I see a galaxy of disaster management professionals, eminent professionals who have given lecture. And as usual, it is most difficult to deliver the last lecture. And I have been given this responsibility. Now coming on to the topic proper, lightning, Yet it is unrecognized, but the biggest killer. The entire data here, what we have taken is from Ministry of Earth Science Institutions, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, India Meteorological Department, Indian Space Research Organization, NRSC, Global Lightning Data Network, 
and death records have been compiled from NCRB, NDMA, states, media reports, and the volunteer network of Cropsey, which is more than 16 lakh. Coming to the news of lightning, always we see this is 7th June, West Bengal, 32 people killed in lightning. This is Amir Fort, 11 July, 16 dead in lightning strike at Amir Fort in Rajasthan. Indonesian refinery on 21st March exploded by lightning strike. In India, we had Banaskantha refinery in Gujarat and Mangalore refinery hit by lightning. And painful news of 18 elephants deaths in Assam. And so was it in Bengal also. Coming on to the topic proper, we all know lightning is the biggest killer, natural hazard. It's a complex phenomena. And we have the solutions also. We have the early warning. We have the do's and don'ts. We have the lightning protection device. It affects rural and urban both. But we have large number of regular deaths despite all our efforts. If you see on lightning, we have deaths, but do we know the hotspots? Do we know the seasonality? Do we understand the risk? Lightning is such a phenomena which happens within flash of seconds. What are its inherent characteristics? Its impact and how to save life being an assets. Early warning we have, but how to disseminate to the people who are vulnerable people who matter, the farmers, the cattle grazers, the jungle hunters, the fishermen, vulnerable and exposure, the basic definition of disaster, how much we relate it to the ground, do's and don'ts, how much we educate our people, lightning protection. I would like to apprise 98% deficiency in the lightning protection. Research and development, where are we? So these are the hounding questions. Lightning, as we all know, is a global phenomena. It has been there since time immemorial. As the Earth evolved, it's there. Even in the Jupiter, you see the biggest storm and lightning. So it's a global phenomena, universal phenomena. At any time, 2 million lightning strikes always keep taking place. And the basic requirement is heat, moisture, that is cloud, and convection. The reason for lightning, global warming, heat, deforestation, depletion, enough have been dwelt upon. Deaths now, it's 24,000 plus per year, per year. And our aim, we try to reduce the way, death. As far as India is concerned, we are into tropical zone, which is a lightning prone area. And if you see the climate change vulnerability index, we have been graded in extreme risk to high risk area. The geographical features play a very important role. Our almost 7,800 kilometer plus coastal area, they are regular, 20, all 12 months vulnerable to lightning. We have the hilly area, we have the Himalayan foothills, we have the desert, all these are affected by lightning strikes. The river basins, the vast meadows, the agriculture field, they all present vulnerable areas for congenial lightning strikes. Before we move further, I would like to go, come on the basic fundamental theory on lightning. Whenever there is a hot area and the moisture comes, that is the cloud comes, there is always a evaporation. It is something akin to when you put hot water on a when you put water on a hot tower, there is a evaporation. Similar is the case with the earth. As the hot earth meets with the cloud, there is convection. As it goes up, if it is powerful enough, they reach 10 to 11 kilometers height, they get converted into ice droplets. In our technical language, we call them droplets. When they collide with each other, there is charge which is developed. 
on the upper side is positive charge negative si charge is on the lower side since earth is positively charged as they get the conductive medium they travel down towards earth and they strike the ground so you have one lightning in the cloud this we call intercloud or intra cloud lightning and the strike which strikes the ground we call cloud to ground lightning so two types of lightning intercloud ic or cloud to ground that is cg as far as the lightning is concerned it's mostly cloud to cloud or cloud to ground lightning in india due to geographical features we divide lightning in hill areas have different lightning developments river basins have different pattern in river basins you will find strike may not be very powerful but the fatalities are very high due to the large open areas in coastal areas there are lightning whenever there is a rain or instability urban oblique semi urban areas also lightning strikes are there but deaths are less there however the electrical losses are phenomenal as far as the impacts are concerned you get injury you get failure of electrical components you get physical damage which results in loss of human life loss of service to the public loss of cultural heritage as we saw in the chitorgarh fort and the amer fort and the economic losses as we saw in the refinery coming on to the human beings please watch this slide very very carefully lightning you see this center one as the lightning strikes the center portion is the most dangerous portion here you can see 10 kilovolt that is a imaginary power which i have donated so it is a vertical strikes and after vertical strikes it spreads laterally and as it goes far away the voltage keeps on reducing so you can see 9 kilovolt 8 kilovolt 7 kilovolt between the two legs you can see 9 kilovolt 8 kilovolt this difference in voltage is called step voltage this is the cause of our death if the step voltage is high we die that is why you will see animals getting lightning bolts and they jump and then they fall on ground this is due to the step voltage as far as the impact is concerned the first impact is the shock the current flows through a human body it sucks your blood causes a respiratory problem ventricular fibrillation and cardiac fibrillation muscular contraction and burn in lightning injuries accident can happen through direct or indirect strike both over 50% of lightning injuries develop in countries is caused by step voltage so coming on again to the topic financial impact injury to death to or death to injury or death to human or to animal electrical losses industrial losses damage to assets as far as the lightning scenario is concerned i showed you you basically need heat and cloud which develops into a cumulonimbus cloud there is always a light wind whenever there is thunderstorm hailstorm squall there is lightning heavy rain also comes along with lightning the cloud burst tornadoes hurricane they come with lightning cyclones also come with lightning and there is a scenario when there is dry lightning you will find even in the daylight scorchy heat there is lightning in fact electrical neutralization is a global phenomena and every day at 1930 gmt this electrical neutralization between the sky and the earth takes place this is more prominent in the equatorial region this is a very important slide you must know the what all contains a lightning strike so as as i said heat plus moisture then electric charge develops then you have intercloud flashes then you have cloud to ground flashes in the in this once the lightning strike travels rounds there is sound which develops this sound develops when the friction is there in the cloud and when the lightning travels down this is low vhf 1 to 30 megahertz energy 250 kJ current 30 to 180 kilo ampere but i must apprise this is sharply increasing and on 28 september at sundargarh 
Sundarnagar in Gujarat, there was lightning strike of 314 kilo ampere. Baroda had 302 kilo ampere of lightning strike. Why I am telling you current? Because your lightning protection system is designed on this. And the global maximum protection standard is 200 kilo ampere. And the Indian lightning protection testing capability is only 40 kilo ampere. So whatever India made lightning protection device you are buying, you are just buying for 40 kilo ampere. And average is this. And temperature is 50,000 degrees centigrade. So even it, is, it can be five times the sun. Lightning in India. So we have launched a Lightning Resilient India campaign or for common people, we come with only three points. Lightning early warning. We have an app called Damini. Dr. Gopal Krishna would have covered in detail. Lightning do's and don'ts, a lightning protection system. Lightning Resilient India campaign, our aim was to reduce 80% deaths in three years. In two years time, we have reduced more than 60% deaths. And you will be happy to know that lightning is no more the biggest killer this year. Flood has overtaken lightning. As far as pillars who are concerned, our patrons in the governing council member, we have senior bureaucrats and scientists from IMD, from ISRO and other organizations. We are grateful to these organizations on the right, you can see who are our partners. Our approach is two pronged approach. First is stop death immediately by aggressive actions. And second is long-term climate change up adaptation for environmental upgradation. Early warning, creating a network of volunteers, develop local lightning safety action plan, lightning risk assessment, scientific research and development, designation of lightning hotspots, education awareness. These are our crux areas. As far as the lightning deaths in India is concerned, since 1967 to 2020, we have the data and more than 1,2,000 people have died. And if you see the percentage wise, lightning deaths are 33% as compared to the other disasters. Next is flood, which is 14%. If you see the comparison between 19 and 20, we have marginally reduced the lightning deaths this year, but we have three states which generally top. That is Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh. Even in 1920, we have Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar. And during 2021, we have again Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, and Bihar. These are the lightning deaths over the last 10 years. This is a statewide trend of lightning for the last 20 years. If you take the average, it is Madhya Pradesh which tops with 315 average deaths per year, followed by Maharashtra, followed by Odisha, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Chhattisgarh, Bihar, Jharkhand, and Karnataka. I would like to do a case analysis. What happens when a lightning deaths, lightning event happens? In Bengal, in two days, 32 people were killed on 7 June. As usual, IMD came out with a lightning forecast three days in advance. That is on 4th, 5th June. These were the models which are available. And this is the action which was supposed to be taken by SDMA or the Disaster Management Department. Sixth night, 10 o'clock, a letter is issued by the Disaster Management Department mentioning urgent measures regarding heavy rainfall 10th to 14th June and preparations for monsoon. In this letter, there is only one passing reference on lightning. It is requested to take urgent measures for preparation of monsoon and create awareness about steps to be taken during floods and the thunderstorms of leak lightning. This is what the state government does. This is the list of deaths. And this is what the strikes happen. And if you see Bengal, there has been significant rise in lightning. There has been 100% rise in lightning and the state government and the community, both are supposed to take cognizance of this. This I'm just giving an example. It is not only case of Bengal. It is a case of most of the states in India, other than Odisha, Andhra Pradesh and Northeastern states, of course. 
these were the strikes which we measure we have the minimum current maximum current we have two types of lightning detection system imt iitm network this is the isro network this all comparison we do and in our research we have found that west bengal is the lightning hot road hot rod zone of india this is the lightning trend in west bengal and so is it is in other states of india we work in west bengal in entire india and we have come out with a affordable model of model of lightning conductor you can see a cycle rim metal rim and you can see a bamboo there is a 14 mm thick wire which is coming down and it has been earthed through locally so this is properly as per principle of physics and we work in the sundarban area various parts of west bengal yet there is a very important need that efforts from the government and community also should be done in lightning most important is seasonality of lightning and its awareness as far as the lightning is concerned we have mapped the lightning in india in 1920 2019 2020 we had 1 crore 38 lakh lightning strikes and in next year we had 1 crore 85 lakh lightning strikes so there has been an increase of you can see the visually the there has been significant in the extreme lightning risk areas and it has been a 34% rise so this is too much and we have local hot spots which are coming up during various quarters we have mapped lightning for every day for every month and i am just showing you to make a difference what happens in during various quarters april to july this is the eastern belt is the hot zone in august to september it spreads up to central india also and in october to december it is a western india rajasthan starts stopping and in january to march it is a himalayan foothills and again the central india these are the numbers first quarter odisha is stopping second quarter madhya pradesh third quarter october december rajasthan and fourth quarter madhya pradesh so if you see we have developed lightning strike not lightning atlas not only for india but for the states also this is a state of west bengal in fact we have shared this with the state government and state governments are supposed to take cognizance of this if you see lightning fatalities month we have a study by dr st pawar of iitm and this says that this is a lightning trend that in june you get the highest lightning strikes but in our study when we have done it for all the states you will find it is different for different states like meghalaya it is not june it is march when you get the highest lightning strikes mizoram it is may when you get the highest lightning strikes again nagaland it is march when you get the highest lightning strike andhra pradesh it is june and october kerala it is november in fact next week we are going to start our awareness program in kerala tamil nadu it is may and november similarly telangana and if you see these lightning strikes they cause deaths and along with these deaths there is huge loss of finances to the governments because each lightning deaths 4 lakh rupees per death is given we have also come out with a lightning timing so we have divided in four quarters first quarter 6 am to 12 12 to 6 pm 6 to 11 and to each state we have graded them when lightning takes place in those states so for 12 months lightning timing has been given by us we have also given geographical you know lightning per square kilometer data and you will be surprised that delhi is figuring in this at a very higher zone that is 13 and if you see population vulnerability delhi comes at number 2 so Delhi, Chandigarh. Now Punjab government has woken up. They have contracted us, and we are doing lightning action plan for them. We have a lightning resilience ratio. This is Kerala is the so far one of the best. We have also gone on a geographical area wise background lightning, back country lightning risk management program. So in a village, you have to identify which are the difficult areas, which are the safer areas, and you have to apprise villages when. 
what to do. Like you see in the hills, if you're going for cattle grazing, the lightning is in the morning is generally on the eastern side. So you should do cattle grazing and farming on the western side. Similarly, if lightning is there in the second half, your agriculture and cattle grazing activity should be on the eastern side. These are lightning safe areas. As far as the lightning origin is concerned, in India, we have seen 34% rise in lightning, whereas the global study by the University of the California University says with one degree rise, it is rise in 12 times, you know, in lightning. Even the IPCC current report had said this, but our is a very, very grim situation. 34% rise in one year time and states like Bengal, Punjab, they have recorded more than 100%. So we need to take more action on ground. This is a percentage increase in lightning strike in the states. Similarly, there has been decrease also in lightning. All those areas where moisture was not there, there was drought area, there was decrease in lightning. But it is a dangerous signal because next year when the monsoon comes, there will be more lightning strikes in these states. As far as the lightning strike is concerned, we have Bay of Bengal. This is the most lightning prone zone of India and Bay of Bengal is the origin. Similarly, on the Western side, we have the Arabian Sea, which causes and Western disturbances. It keeps on disturbing India as a, and throughout the year, they cause instability in the weather and there are lightning strikes. The lightning cloud, which comes from the Bay of Bengal, it divides it here in two parts. One is it goes to the east up to Shillong, Nagaland, and on the west, it goes to Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh. As the monsoon moves, this pattern keeps on changing. I'm just showing it for the academic purpose. We have lightning even in January month. This is due to the anticyclonic circulation, which takes place at the bottom at our both the Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, and it goes straight up to the Himalayas. And then you will see in Himalaya, Tharais, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, lightning in winter. Lightning in winter in Delhi is also very common. And Western disturbance adds fuel to the fire. We have also identified lightning victims. 96% people are from the rural background. 70% farmers, 34% women, 35% children. And then there is adverse impact on the children mental health. Wherever lightning is there, children, their the mental development becomes slow. There is a very intimate, intimate relation between the tribal and the lightning. Since tribal have open, you know, life, lifestyle, livelihood, and their houses are mostly in the tree around trees, so they get more lightning strikes. And if you see, this is a district in Odisha, Mayurbhanj. In 2018, Mayurbhanj had 152 deaths in one year. But due to our action, we have taken especially this area, southern Jharkhand, eastern Chhattisgarh. And now Mayurbhanj is having lightning deaths below 20 for the last two years. There are large number of deaths of animals. This is a case of Kashmir. This is a case in Andhra Pradesh. And if you take the revenue loss, the compensation paid by the government in last various years, it's more than hundreds of crores. And Odisha is the state which has done good and they have reduced the lightning deaths and we awarded them with the Lightning Resilient India Award and so is to the Andhra Pradesh state. They have achieved more than 70% reduction in lightning deaths. And if you consider reducing deaths, these are the green, state, green states, Odisha, Andhra, Nagaland, Mizoram, Jharkhand, Maharashtra, Assam, West Bengal, Kerala, Karnataka, Punjab. And these are the red states, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Delhi, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh. Bihar has done good job, but they have not been able to reap a good result this year. We have the complete lightning risk management solutions, which we give to states. We have proper memorandum of understanding with government of India organizations like India Meteorological Department, NRSC, and the state governments. And we function with them and we carry out lightning 
complete advisory and the lightning action plan. We prepare a dedicated action plan based on the guideline. I'm also part of the National Committee of Experts on Lightning at NDMA. So we have guidelines on lightning. We have started off Vajrapath Suraksha Rath for awareness. This is a picture of Rachi, my hometown, where we are launching. We launched this before the season. It goes up to villages and carries out awareness. So this is a ownership. This is a deputy commissioner of Ranchi and all circle officers were made to host it in their respective blocks. Similarly, we have started off state lightning action plan and seasonal events, especially Kal Baisakhi, pre-monsoon, terminal monsoon, western disturbances. We create lightning awareness through the, with the help of our volunteers. We have apprised the states of their hotspots, lightning arrester of the conductor installation devices, village risk management program, fort and archaeological hill, heritage management, lakes, hills, and industrial lightning risk management, school, farmers, and community places safety. We have created booklets for schools, children. Victim identification is very important. They are basically, you saw in Rajasthan, it was tourist. In Goa, it was tourists, farmers, cattle grazers, people working in open. We have developed a lot of IC material, and those are mostly hosted now on the NDMA website. State Lightning Action Plan, basically how to operationalize a lightning action that has been done, and a guideline has been issued by us, which is there on the NDMA website. There are a lot of policy interventions which are invoked. So there is a change in the building bylaws coming. School safety plan is being up, updated. We have farmer safety plan. We have cattle safety plan. We have mainstreaming lightning safety with other government schemes like Manrega, watershed program, PhD, drinking water program, solar mission. In fact, in solar mission, it has been made mandatory that lightning conductor is a must. So lightning, this is the action plan. We have given it to our volunteers and the state governments are doing it through various agencies, educating people. It is very important to understand this part, lightning strikes vertically as well as laterally. You will see large number of deaths in the agriculture field in Bihar. This is because this vertical strike is at one place, but the lateral strikes due to vast open ground, large number of farmers are hit. So it is very important for us to understand the characteristics of lightning strikes. Risk assessment method methodology, details of the area, assets which need to be protected, we should work out. We should always see the vulnerability and exposure. It is the exposure which is very, very critical in lightning. It is short phenomena. So whenever you get the early warning, you should prevent exposure. Come to the lightning safe shelter. Geographical vertical vulnerability has to be identified. Lightning strike history has to be done and it has to be related to the lightning risk map. Exposure risk, we have come out with a new guideline for lightning protection and Bureau of Indian Standards and few ministries has already issued the lightning protection guideline based on our work. There is calculate lightning risk index. It is very important. Lightning risk map has been developed and it has been shared. We have also come out with a lightning public notification device. There is, it's a device, you can see it's on a pole, it has a speaker and you send a SMS to this device. This device will announce in the same language what you have sent the SMS. So that's the beauty of this device. You can also sound hitter, putter, and you can de-alert people. After alerting, it is very important to deactivate, de-alert people. So you can do with this device. This we have developed in consultation with IMD and the Rajasthan State Disaster Management Authority. Mind it, this device, people were, have been importing in crores of rupees you know, from abroad. We have just made it within two lakh rupees in India. Depending on location, it costs around 1.5 to two lakh rupees. So this is a device which we have created. Lightning capacity building is a very important program in fact, if you do proper capacity building, you can reduce 70% deaths of lightning. And in this, do's and don'ts, 
and setting up a lightning warning system is very important. There is a five second rule. In fact, this rule utilizes the principle of speed of light and sound. We all know light travels faster than sound. So whenever there is lightning, we see the flash first. And if you see the flash first, start counting. One, two, three, four, five. And if you can count up to five, it means lightning is one mile away. If you can count up to 10, it means lightning is two mile away. This counting gives you the time, reaction time, so that you can go and put yourself in a safe shelter. Nature always gives you alert. Whenever there is lightning, there's a black round, round cloud which comes. We call them cumulonimbus cloud. There is, you know, goosebumps. You will get tingling. There will be slight breeze. So that is a nature's early warning of lightning. We have educated women, self-help groups, and other various groups like children. And these are the IC posters. This is our tagline, 70% people in India die because they stand under tree when there is a lightning or rain. So we say, Jab bijli kare garjana, ped ke niche kabhi na rehna. When lightning roars, never stand under tree. Never take selfie during lightning. Don't use mobile phone outside. During lightning, keep your doors and windows closed. It has been developed by our intern, Ms. Sangvi Kennedy from Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Whenever there is lightning outside, do not use tap, tap water. Do not wash utensil, do not take bath. And if you're trapped in lightning, please get into crouch position. Your knees should be, your ankles should be together. Why together? Because then you'll, you know, present yourself as a single target and lightning will just come and pass it like this. Like a bird doesn't get hit, similarly, you will get you will not get hit. If you have a difference between this, you will create step voltage and it will get into your body and you will get electrocuted. Football field is not safe. Whenever you see a lightning, come to school, home or car. The car is safe because of being Faraday's cage. You must install lightning arrestor at your house or office. Outcome of our action so far, there has been significant awareness, education and training case study and remedial measures we are giving, reduction in deaths in the states, in up to 50 to 60% except UP, Bihar and MP, lightning hazard atlas has been prepared for the first time for country, for all the states, there is value addition to IMD and IITM products, promotion to research-based inputs and disaster management. We also undertake researches for lightning research. Way forward, reduce deaths reduce deaths to zero. Now, government of India has given a mandate that lightning risk program is going to be a permanent program, a national program of the government. And this will be undertaken at the national level by National Disaster Management Authority. And next year onwards, we are going to have a proper lightning program. I'm sorry, I'm not able to show you. In fact, we have been able to pursue the government to notify lightning as a disaster and we have been able to succeed in making lightning a national lightning risk management program. Impact-based innovative early warning, we are already with IMD and contributing this, and community awareness is also going. Conduct lightning safety program, we have various modules for farmers, women, school, industries, and other sectors. We are also doing lightning risk audit, and we are also educating people about what type of lightning protection device to be utilized and promotion to innovation, research and development, and climate change grassroots level adaptation. This is the action we are doing. I'll be happy to take any question if it is there. Thank you, sir. And this is really uh, such a nice presentation and that's really a good awareness for all of us also. And Yes, now the question and answer session getting begin. And any uh, participant having question, please ask. You can ask now. So I have actually uh, some questions I get through the through the through the text.
Uh, uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, just, just mute, mute it, it, sir, or, or just stop, stop the presentation, the presentation, then I will begin. Okay. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? Yes, sir, uh, sure, sir. I am yes, Professor Nalhusna, uh, okay. formerly professor at the Indian Institute of Science in the Hotel Department. Uh, I should really thank Colonel Srivastava for a very illuminating, very broad-based lecture on lightning. Uh, very useful indeed. But only one suggestion, the lightning crouch has been abandoned for recommendation by the National Weather Service of uh, USA from 2008 itself. The logic is that, suppose a person sits like that on the toes of the leg, how long can he wait? Nobody knows to what in second or what minute or what half an hour also he can get a lighting in that area. So it has been recognized it is not a useful thing. So the National Weather Service of USA has stopped recommending it from 2008 itself. That's it. Thank you so much, sir. Point noted, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other question from participants? I have some question through text. Uh, the I think this is the for uh, Iftikar sir. I think somebody asked the question that uh, what are the main obstacles to infrastructure development in Bangladesh uh, coastal cities? Okay, I can answer that. Uh, coastal cities. If you talk about the main cities, I think. That is something else. My focus, though, in that presentation was much more like in rural areas. And some of those areas are very remote, very hard to get. When I personally went for my field studies, it took me a lot of time. You would go first, maybe take a car from the main city, go to a ferry point. Then you have to cross the river or two by a ferry. Then finally, when you're actually on the side, these are offshore islands or kind of like very coastal areas, then you would have to get up on a motorbike on the back of someone driving a motorbike on these, um, I don't know what you call them in your language. We call them aisle in Bengali. These are like uh, very small raised embankments that divide uh, paddy fields. <laughs> and they are made out of mud and you go on them. And it's kind of... You know, ultimately, you actually go to the site, and some. So they are very remote. You can imagine the challenges of actually providing infrastructure, and infrastructure in the sense that you see it, modern infrastructure may not be a realizable dream for many of those areas, but you could have like some kind of incremental approach. By like, remember I showed you that photograph when they had these brick soling on these raised embankments. That's one way, and over time they may be able to pave it with asphalt and kind of make a pakka road. But you see, it's just a slow process of improving the infrastructure there. One thing I do want to tell you, though, is that interestingly, there's been a spontaneous solar power revolution, if I may use the word, in these coastal areas, and because they don't, they are not connected to the national grid. I think Bangladesh still, I think, is about around 50 percent of electrification nationwide. So because of, of the isolation and remoteness of these areas, they cannot extend the national grid to these areas. So what they have done is that they have started using solar connections. It's interesting, you might go and find a thatch roof with a solar collector on top using uh, that for generating electricity at the household level. And this, and you know, I can just chat a little bit about it in the, uh, 80s when they started introducing solar power through the large NGOs, the Grameen Bank and others, it was very expensive and people didn't want it. Now the price has gone down because of the private sector involvement. And, and when I'm talking about the private sector, these are informal dealers in these coastal areas. And once there's a market competition, they're all producing it and copycats are there and people are, you know, just it's available and people are buying these small solar collectors for very little money and they're using renewable energy for powering the household. So I think we have to be kind of innovative 
when we think about infrastructure in areas like that, it won't be the conventional approach of, you know, infrastructure in that area. But again, you know, I think there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of infrastructure development in Bangladesh compared to what it was before. I would imagine the last decades, many of the smaller towns have been connected by road networks. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, let's agree also that this developing is uh, fast. Uh, Bangladesh is developing fast through the all the uh, hurdles. It's like crossing all the hurdles and preparing for that everything. Thank yes. you so much, sir. Interestingly, uh, the Podda Bridge over yes. the Ganges has finally been completed. That is a massive undertaking and it's a massively long bridge. You can imagine when the Ganges enters Bangladesh and becomes a Podda, it becomes a very, very wide river. In parts of it, it looks like the sea. And to actually build a bridge in a developing country context like Bangladesh, it's, it's actually a massive you know, achievement, I would say. Uh -huh. yes, yes, thank can you, I, sir. Oh, yeah. Yes. Can I make another small point regarding Colonel Srivastava's uh, topic? Again, I'm Professor Nagabhushna speaking. See, regarding the regarding one of the slides, the a voltage of 10 kV, 8 kV, 6 kV were mentioned. I do not know if they are the right units. Uh, the reason why I'm saying is that it's high resistivity, maybe of the order of about 1,000 ohm centimeter. But remember, we have to remember that the soil resistivity is a very highly nonlinear parameter. Uh, beginning, it can be soil resistivity can be about the order of about 1000 ohm centimeter. It goes down remarkably. So even if you have a normal uh, rod to ground, the resistance comes down to about 40 ohms. Resistance of the treatment uh, electrode comes down to 40 ohms. Even if you assume uh, the mean current of roughly about 40 kiloamperes, at the point of strike, the voltage will be approximately 1,600 kilowatts. That will be for a few microseconds, no doubt about it. And as you go farther off, it go, goes down as the inverse square of the distance because the current density goes on reducing with the distance as the inverse square, i upon 2 pi r squared. It goes down. So this kV, I don't know if there is something, some mistake in the figure or whatever it is. So close to any grounded object, whether it's a tree, or a pole, metallic or otherwise, can be extremely dangerous. Proximities can be extremely dangerous. Uh, that's why, in fact, he also mentioned it, Dr. Colonel Shivas also mentioned it, the maximum number of threats is due to the ground currents. He called it lateral currents. I believe he meant ground currents. The maximum number of threats, approximately 50% or more, are due to such ground strokes. So, uh, it's preferable to stay at least about 10 meters away from all tall objects, including trees, microwave towers, even single metallic poles. It's preferable to maintain a distance of at least about 10 meters away from that. Otherwise, you know, if, for example, if we take a single pole, say some 40 feet uh, tall, uh, one may think that it gives a lot of protection. It does use a lot of protection only within a conical volume, that too only for a building. If there is a human being there, he is subject to, very severely subject to the ground current failure, ground current uh, fatality. This is what I would like to mention. Probably that one of the slides where you mentioned 10 kV, 8 kV, etc. I think it needs a relook. I would like to request Colonel Shivasar to have a relook at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. The point taken, sir, and it is always there for very, you know, micro microseconds. That no, I no, 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 microseconds, not micro micro microseconds. Yes, because yes. the rise time of the typical lightning current is of the order of four to ten microseconds, or even slightly more. It's not in micro microseconds. It's in microseconds. Same, sir. Microseconds. I point taken, sir, and since. Nowadays, the strikes are there, successive strikes are coming, sir. Yeah, yeah, surely. So that is why we are saying that just trying to give an example to how what the, how does the step voltage there. So I have written, you know, those yeah. things. So just for us, because when the moment uh, you go on to the scientific languages, sir, for general, you know, crowd, it becomes difficult. So ground current, like I have converted into lateral strikes, uh -huh, I convert uh -huh. it to drop water <laughs> from top, you know, vertical strike. Once it splashes around, that is ground current, you know. So 
for a common understanding when we go to it is basically we are into a citizen science approach sir making science simple understandable to a common man so through all our volunteers network what we are doing making science simple for the common people so that they easily adopt it sir otherwise adoption becomes difficult you know when you have low literacy level and when you have a vast diversity in the crowd sir i would like to make a small suggestion uh, okay. when you say lateral stroke in brackets you can say ground current say to yeah. be technically also right it is only a small suggestion but i was i must really compliment you on the wonderful lecture you have given it was very broad area very beautifully done can i have your email id sir uh, shall i tell you yes you yes, 50 su 50 yes you 50 50 underscore underscore nag n a g nag n a g nag at yahoo.com right sir yahoo.com i will send a mail to you sir thank you very much technical reports our reports are hosted on the wmo sites and mm -hmm. various sites i would like yeah. request a eminent person like you to have a review and give us suggestions on this sir. thank How you very kind it? of you very kind of you to give me this uh, opportunity uh, I probably i may mention that i have been working with lightning and associated uh, phenomena from 1963 onwards when i joined as a faculty of the department of high water engineering in university of science starting with lightning resistance power systems lighting protection of transmission lines towers etc <laughs> now right now uh, i have set up a complete lightning test facility for testing of aircraft from the lowest current of course which is not impossible we can go right up to 300 kilo amperes it is one of the very unique facilities in the country definitely amongst the best in the whole world also if you need any work to be done in this area you might you know at the moment it's under the control of center for airborne systems i set up the whole laboratory in 1989 92 and i am still using it for testing of helicopter blades and uh, other air aircraft components for the full threat lightning full threat lightning is not only the first strike of 200 kilo amperes it is followed by 2 kilo amperes for a, a 5 milliseconds followed by 200 amperes for a full second and a raised first raised strike of 100 kilo amperes see this is what i have been doing uh, only if you have got any experimental work to be done any experimental verification of anything we'll be happy to do it one thing is we'll have to address it to them and if there are any charges you know right now it's under the control of the center for air war and systems in bangalore i'll be happy to be of any assistance to you in this regard thank you so much sir i am an air defense you, officer yeah and i i specialize on radar remote sensing and satellite technology on the user side sir so Very I'm good. A, I'm a, I'm take on electronics and I'm take on armament, basically missile technology. Wonderful, wonderful. I'll get in touch with you, sir. Surely, surely. Thank I'll be you, very sir. happy to be of any assistance to you. Thank you. Well, the other testing, just a minute, Shifra. Yeah. Testing is the biggest gray area area in India, sir. You know the CPRI, our testing facility of lightning conductors are only up to 40 kilo amperes, sir. We, we can pass. To... We can pass 200 kilo amperes fully. Followed by two kilometers, followed by two hundred kilometers, followed by hundred kilometers. As per, huh? you are most welcome. I will be most happy. I will be most happy. I have given the email address. You are welcome to uh, contact me any time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shibra. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for such nice information. Uh, so now we reach at the end point of this three-day online capacity building program, and I would like to call Professor Santosh Kumar, Professor and Head of the Department Governance Inclusive Disaster Risk Reduction (NIDM), Government of India, to address us at this time. So this is uh, uh, now over to you, Professor Santosh, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was indeed a three-day journey which we had. it was very very informative when the kind of dialogue the bilateral dialogue was going on between colonel shrivastava and our eminent uh, scientist who is sitting here uh, and his piece of advice is also very very useful for us and i have also noted your email id sir for uh, further uh, this if i have uh, noted it uh, this is u50 and underscore naz at the rate of cloud nag nag N A N A Z, N A G G for gold. Okay, 
yahoo.com so it was wonderful uh, experience uh, as uh, i must thank uh, uh, <clears throat> our partner that is the which we say as a kind of uh, the engagement which we had uh, for three days uh, and uh, um, and different topics and uh, different uh, and vishwajit uh, ray was there the first day also and i can see him today also so and in between also he was there so my heartfelt thanks to you uh, mr vishwajit ray uh the conclusion which we are listening to various presentation and bangladesh experience was coming on the infrastructure and uh, in the region south asia region when we talk about disaster risk management a lot of things to also be to be emulated from bangladesh uh, especially when we talk about the building financial resilience in the light of disaster management and uh, many of the innovative steps for which bangladesh is known one is that community based engagement for the disaster risk reduction is itself is a very very big uh, kind of experiment uh, successfully uh, brought down the mortality rate in bangladesh due to cyclonic storms the second important thing which uh, uh, how they are going ahead with the engagement of a uh, large number of traditional knowledge into a modern science with the modern initiatives so that is also very very important uh, learning which we see that science uh, may be growing very fast but uh, what i think once it is uh, validated on the basis of science it has a real value on that also. so bangladesh again i will quote this as an a kind of a, a very very uh, good experience to uh, hear and professor yunus example itself a gramin bank itself is a, a very very kind of a, a informative in terms of for us uh, uh, taking this uh, building financial resilience but in india also large number of practices and across the globe started on those lines but when it comes to the science and uh, uh, the whole uh, three day uh, time which we spent the uh, especially on the uh, intervention of indian meteorological department yesterday uh, the day before yesterday i was listening to the indian meteorological department and uh, also that how west bengal experience in that way if you see that holistically how disaster management is going i said that lightning is one of the biggest threat which has come up now uh, in the last uh, and when we see that 1963 that kind of a study was established in india i was not aware about that but uh, uh, sir has mentioned about that that uh, is established and uh, so what i am saying is that a lot of uh, 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 this uh, different dots to be brought together and we have to join those dots and joining the dots itself is a big task for uh, institution like nidm institution like sai uh, which are working for the south asian nations and all so uh, if you start looking at those uh, uh, in the context of uh, that from here if you imagine disaster risk management and or if we say that we are redrafting uh, the agenda uh, in the uh, in the kind in the light of 15 finance commissions a recommendation where the first time in the history of india that ex ante pre disaster risk reduction uh, actions to be taken so in this context if you look at and redesign our ad hoc finance was to also mentioned about that now lighting also has been included as a disaster scenario our ipcc is also giving warning again and again that it is a biggest thing to be uh, taken care of so in the institutional arrangements of disaster risk management uh, like we have different ministries to address such kind of a problem Uh, like uh, if we talk about uh, road accidents is the ministry of surface transport if you are talking about air accidents there is a ministry of civil aviation if any technical hazard then we are talking about the ministry of environment and forest they are there so uh, similarly when it comes to the lighting when it comes to the financial resilience when it comes to uh, uh, other uh, new phenomena which are emerging Uh, how those experiences of different countries can be brought in and can be taken into a kind of a uh, institutionalized intervention uh, in in the country 
uh, as we say that uh, climate change has influenced immensely our whole weather, weather pattern. So, uh, climate change is in influencing weather pattern. Then definitely lots of things to be done for the science, uh, for the economics, for the social science. Uh, so uh, rural areas, urban areas. So holistically, we need to look at. And uh, the three days deliberations on various topics has given many insights. Uh, so I would definitely request both the institutions to work together on this. Uh, 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 and like in, uh, yesterday, yesterday, Jinder Nayak was there. And Jinder Nayak was talking about a uh, whole pattern of response has also got changed. So just not the response, it's everything is changing uh, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, human intervention. Uh, so what we see as uh, whether we talk about submarine or when we talk about beneath the uh, this ground, uh, on the ground, above the ground, things are not the same as uh, 50 years ago. And uh, the causes of drought, cause uh, the the number and frequency and intensity of droughts, the frequency and intensity of lightning, the frequency and intensity of uh, flooding situation, the frequency and intensity of cyclonic storms, all have a uh, change uh, pattern. So holistically, if you have to see, and uh, what we say that everything gets converged, whether science, sociology, economics, philosophy, all discipline get converged to the people's need. If I am needing anything, uh, uh, so everything moves around the people's requirement, whether the low cost housing and the infrastructure or the uh, modern uh, design infrastructure or whatever we may conceive. But uh, uh, my urge for listening to these three days program that uh, ultimately we will say that science would prevail in quantifying the whole kind of uh, uh, problems and also providing solutions. Uh, so uh, learning from different countries experiences, learning from wisdom of the uh, science, uh, which we always say that science is a 500 years old kind of a thing. So, but in 500 years old, uh, which we say, although physics got invented billions of years ago, but uh, <laughs> but what is the the modern science, which we say as a kind of uh, uh, the institutional uh, learning of science, which is we say that it has a lot of things to contribute when uh, in the whole evolution of human history. So, I would not say much here. I would extend my heartfelt thanks to our partner, all the speakers, and my team. Uh, for taking this very, very important program. And I can consider the kind of resource persons they deliberated from uh, all over the world. We can say that we were in Australia and other places and all. Uh, yesterday, some questions we were receiving from Melbourne and uh, some, uh, some other countries also. So this has a real uh, engagement of a large number of uh, experts from different fields, uh, and uh, they have enriched this program and I'm sure that past participant must have benefited out of this. But I would request uh, uh, our partner, Shair Chairman, uh, to have a kind of a Bishwajit, uh, I would request you formally also to continue this engagement with an IDM so we can have a co-learning also and we can move on the learning path faster than in the time frame. So I would stop by extending my heartfelt thanks to all the delegates and especially my heartfelt thanks to all the participants. Uh, without them, it would not have been successful. But the resource person, the kind of pain which they took, I'm really grateful to them. And I extend my heartfelt thanks to the, them from on behalf of NITM and also on behalf of SIRE. Thank you very much. Over to you, if you wish to say, Bishwajit, on the, my request. And any of the delegates who are attending, they can share uh, one or two points. I would uh, happy to take it as a my takeaway from here. Any resource person participant, if they wish to suggest something for us, we can we are very glad to take that. Over to you. Floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, first of all, once again, I would like to share my sincere thanks to you and your department. Also, uh, Honorable E.D., sir, 
Manoj Bindal sir and all my, uh, the resource persons, those who have joined from the different parts of the India as well as. And uh, though we have designed this program within a very short span of time, but still uh, we had a belief that it will be definitely it will be a successful event. And we already got a lots of informations from the different participants personal level. Sir, this is a very wonderful initiation and we would like to continue this session in further also and also in further in application sectors or other in a big platform. So as I mentioned in the very first day of inaugural session that we are planning on behalf of Syed, we are planning to uh, do uh, international event that is the South Asian Consortium of Disaster Management in there and definitely I will approach to uh, Professor Shantosh sir in this regard to for the associations of NIDM in this regard and different other organizations those who, who, who um, we, we, we are related that is the NMCG we are right now the N regional capacity building center of NMCG of Minister of Jal Shakti and NIUA Minister of Urban Affairs so we they are also interested even I had already connected with the NESAC uh, they will also join this kind they has also shown their interest to be part of that program and I promise that definitely we are looking forward for the further expansion for the development of this initiative and the resource persons. I, I must uh, specially thanks to Ipta Hamad sir, Abhishek Shah, Dr. Abhishek Shah and also Colonel Sanjay Srivastav sir for his wonderful lecture. Because uh, though I was in a meeting in a random meeting from the different ministries, so from the morning 10, so that's why still now I'm in the car, but uh, I, I follow, thoroughly try to follow the different lectures of the different resource persons. So definitely I will uh, thank to all of you, all the participants. And in this regard, hopefully we can also do this kind of initiation and the participants, I would like to say one thing that your uh, participation, your active cooperation definitely help us to encourage for further uh, conduction of this, this kind of initiative pro or programs also. So with this, once again, I would like to thank, share my thanks. But uh, before concluding my lecture, I would like to request to some of our four participants, if they say about this few feedbacks, two to three participants, because the time is very limited. So if anybody from the audience, please share some two to three points or suggestions or further any feedback on behalf of your side, we will be grateful because it will help for the development of our uh, further ex develop expansion also. So please. If any participants. So I I, I saw that uh, Mr. Sanjeev, Mr. Sanjeev, you say something. Yeah, actually, lightning is affecting entire tropical belt and South Asia. And India has created good practices, you know, in saving life, including safe infrastructure. And we offer our services to our neighboring countries if they are willing. Some of them are already taking, but through your network also, if you want our services, they are available and all these microzonation, hotspot designation and all can be done for any country. That's all. Over to you. Thank you, thank you. And sir, uh, Shantosh sir, I would like to uh, ask you, okay, why don't we can create this kind of uh, the resource persons? Why don't we can create a one kind of consortium like that or council like that for I different experts, uh, experts from different I parts of? Your point. Hello. What's your point? And uh, I am really uh, looking forward to such kind of initiative. We can do it together. Yes, sir. Thank you. Definitely. We'll do it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So if there is no audience, so I will request to Moon Moon, ma'am, please conclude this today's session. Oh, you, Ahmad, I, I would uh, request you also to uh, be associated with us. Uh, yes. We will. Yeah. So that when you said that. Pleasure. That will be my pleasure and honor. I already had a discussion with Dr. Bishwadi this morning about that. So we are progressing along that line. I mean, they'll be very good. I already had some association with Colonel Chivasteva through his No Disasters magazine earlier. So mm -hmm. I, I already know some of you. And of course, we are connected on Facebook, many of us. 
Professor Santos, you too. We are Facebook friends for a long time, so we know what we are doing. So we should, <laughs> we should bond closer together. I think there's great opportunity to do it. So thank you for that. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, uh, can I note uh, some issues? I can't hear. Can you repeat? Uh, can I make some uh, issues? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, um, um, that is, uh, sir, uh, can uh, can uh, NIDM uh, offer some uh, projects uh, uh, in uh, for, for corporate projects? Any uh, uh, issues uh, like uh, some um, uh, wetlands uh, uh, destructions uh, or some? Mangrove destructions. Um, any project call? Oh, we are open to this idea. That's what we are saying. That let us work together and have a more bilateral dialogue. And there, if it emerges, definitely we will go ahead with uh, uh, that. Okay. No. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, Shipra, well, I sorry, I forgot to thank to you, and <laughs> she's a for his initiation, that's why. So now, uh, Munmun ma'am, you please conclude this today's session and hope in future we will go for the, any further development of this program. Yes, and Munmun Mun, Mun, ma'am, please, over to you. Yes, sir, definitely we will be looking forward about this association further also. We would, uh, we would like to uh, set the platform again. We would like to hear again from our MNM speakers, sir. And uh, yes, the participants here, uh, like, uh, uh, I can appreciate their patience they uh, and patience and they encourage also their encouragement also. So yes, about uh, along with this point, first of all, I would like to express my deep gratitude to all the eminent speakers for gracing your crucial work and sharing with us your opinion and finding. Uh, this was a wonderful session because of all of you through such impactful presentations. So uh, thanks to you for all the speakers for all these three days. And on behalf of SIA team, I would like to extend a very hearty vote of th thanks to supervising patron, Major General uh, Manoj Kumar Bindal, Executive Director, NIDM Government of India, along with Dr. Vishujit Rai Chaudhary, uh, and along with our convener, Professor Santosh Kumar, Professor and HOD Governance, uh, Governance Inclusive Disaster Risk Reduction NIDM Government of India for bless us through their addresses. And I would like to mention Dr. S. Dayal, Faculty and Director, Center for Disaster Management and Planning, Sire, for his kind support to our team. As I can say, no program can become successful with a single person, and it took uh, months to uh, it took some month uh, more than a month I can say that to uh, uh, to engage with many peoples and to uh, pre present such a uh, speech uh, and to give the opportunity to such a for such a um, participant to hear such a uh, impactful from impactful speakers so for that I extend my big thanks to program coordinator Mr. Arindam Ray Director Academic Affairs Sayad Ms. Antara Kundu, Project Executive Syed, and yes, uh, Ms. Shipra Das, Young Professional Project Executive NITM for such nice coordination with us. I would like to take this opportunity to say big thank to you all the listeners for your active presence and patience, of course. Here, I would like to thank everyone to make this event such a successful event for all of us. And we would like to extend it further also, and for future also, we would like to continue this for sure. I would also extend thanks. my heart to thanks to everyone and also Professor Nagabhushan for making this kind of intervention and very, very important intervention he could make. And I'm really grateful to you, sir. Thank you very much. I look forward to any cooperation possible from my side. Thank you very much once again. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nagabhushan, sir. Thank you. For thank, you. thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. We should close now. Yeah. Yes, sir. So Thank we should close you. and uh, we should have very happy puja, happy Navratri to all Thank of you. And yes. So, because, uh, so we are entering into the field of uh, magnetic field of Devi Paksha. <laughs> so Thank everybody, you. happy puja to all of you.
happy navratri and definitely we will meet in a bigger platform in a uh, coming days thank you thank you, okay. thank thank you very you. much all the best to all of you thank you bye thank you bye thank you bye